your Bibles, please, tonight. Should be one in the pew there if you didn't bring yours, but they're, they're available. And turn to Psalm 61. Psalm 61. If you need notes for tonight, just hold your hand up. The men are ready to serve you with those. The message tonight is something I certainly need on occasion, and I know that all of us need it. What to do when overwhelmed. What to do when overwhelmed. Taking a detour, a brief detour from our series we've been doing on Psalm, or Genesis 49. And but tonight, Lord, laid this on my heart as I was preparing this a couple of days ago for our staff training, for our teachers, and uh, felt it very apropos for tonight. What to do when overwhelmed. Psalm 61, beginning in verse number 1. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me, and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covet of thy wings. Selah. Father, we ask you to help us tonight. Lord, we know that in every home, every life, every heart, there are times where we just get overwhelmed. In times we don't think we can make it. And many times in times like that, Lord, we make wrong decisions. We say wrong things. We go wrong directions. So, Father, I pray that tonight you would just equip us. Now, Lord, maybe this is a, a preventative message, a preparatory message for chaos, difficulties, heartaches, pains that are coming in the future. Maybe some are in them right now that you would use this to be a, the tool and the blessing they need tonight to be what we need to be. So, Lord, in your special way, with your special word, I pray, Lord, that you would work in might and in power and in a marvelous way that we might be leaving here in just a few moments built up, encouraged, more like your sons, and more ready for the battles that are before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. David here is writing. And as you saw, it says there in verse number 2, When my heart is overwhelmed, when my heart is overwhelmed. David, as best we can understand at this point, is on the run from Absalom. If you know the story, Absalom, his son that he loved so much and cared for, his favorite son, he loved so very much, had rebelled against him, had taken an army, built an army, and now driven David out of his kingdom, driven out of the city, and David's on the run, and Absalom now has just betrayed him and doing all sorts of terrible things with his, with his wives, and it's just a mess. And so David is now on the run for his life from his own son, Absalom. I don't know about you, but if I was on the run from my son that I loved and not knowing what was going to happen to my kingdom, what was going to happen to my life, I think I might feel a little overwhelmed. He had many difficulties. He was there hiding in caves. He was just fearful for his, his life and from his son. The word overwhelmed there, where it says in verse 2, in the Hebrew, is a primitive word that means to shroud, that is to clothe, to languish in darkness. So the idea is he felt covered up, he felt shrouded, he was languishing, he was in anguish and in darkness. I don't know, but I have on occasion in my life or two felt a little bit that way, overwhelmed, a little bit in darkness, a little bit covered, a little bit over, over pressured, and just kind of languishing. Can anybody else get testified tonight? You've been overwhelmed in your life. All right. We, we all have that. It may be financial. It may start with finances. You lose your job. They're getting ready to take your house. Uh, you don't have an answer for anything like that. And you put on top of that, your health then goes. So it may be finances plus health plus family issues. Your kids let you down. Your spouse lets you down. Your neighbors let you down. It could be uh, political issues. We look at our nation and see the direction our nation is going and the difficulties our nation has and all the, the hatred and bitterness from that, uh, the next COVID pass through, all those things. And if we're not careful, we can get to the place like David there talked about. His heart was overwhelmed. Not just his mind, not just his spirit, but his heart, where he lives, where he believes, where he feels. It was overwhelmed. And he says, my heart was overwhelmed. We're going to experience that. And in this passage, we find about how faith helped him, how his faith 
took him through, how his faith developed him so that he could make it through the time where his heart was overwhelmed. Now, again, I remind you, when we go talk about making it through times like that, we're not talking about just, well, I made it through, praise the Lord. No, we're talking about coming through stronger, more on fire for God, more loving of God. So when we come through it, yes, we were overwhelmed. Yes, there was heartaches. Yes, there was difficulty. But we come out stronger on the other side. And that's what we see with David as he's now, he said, my heart is overwhelmed, but his faith is helping him through. His faith is taking him through the process. Now, just a couple little introductory thoughts. Faith is not a barrier that prevents trouble from coming. How many understand that? You can have all the faith in the world and you're still going to have trouble. You'll still have days of difficulty. You'll still have years of difficulty. Christians and people that believe, well, once I'm saved and once I have the Holy Spirit inside, everything's going to be calm. Everything's going to be sweet. Everybody's going to love me. No more problems. I'm just going to coast through the rest of my life. Have not read the Bible. Difficulties come many times because we're Christians, because we're living for God. God says that if we're going to live... A, a holy life, that we will suffer persecution. So faith is not a barrier that prevents trouble from coming, but it is a shield that keeps those troubles from conquering us. So the greater faith we have, the greater shield we have, and that we can go through those trials that will not be conquered. The victory that David had and the victory that we find is you're going to go through your troubles you're going to go through those times when you're languishing. Now, some of you look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. I, I hope you never have to experience that day where you begin to wonder, shall I live? Shall I continue? What must I do? And our hearts are overwhelmed. But we don't find victory through that in our own strength. Are you listening? We don't find in our strength. People like me sometimes, boy, I say, I'm going to be strong, and I'm going to be tough, and I'm going to be hard, and I'm going to make it through. That won't give you the victory. It may sustain you for a little bit, but when that overwhelming of our heart comes, it won't do it. The victory is not found in our strength. It's only found in the power of God and faith in His ability to sustain us. Again, leaning on Him. But we're all going to have those times where we're overwhelmed. Just put it down. And here's the faith we have to take us through the trials and through the problems. By the way, it's through the trials and through the problems, and even one of those times we feel overwhelmed and tears are coming down our face and we just are languishing, can't sleep at night and our hearts are broken, it's those times that we grow in faith. Are you listening to me? We only grow through trials. We only grow through difficulties. We only learn about the, what God can do for us by the trials. We sing that song all the time, uh, through it all, through it all. Here's a verse from through it all. I thank God for the mountains. And I thank Him for the valleys. I thank Him for the storms He brought me through. For I had never had a problem. I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I never know what faith in God could do. So until we have problems, we're nearly not going to grow. Until we get to the place where we are overwhelmed in our heart and we're oppressed and we feel down and we feel shrouded and we feel in the dark and we feel tormented, until we have those things in our life, we don't know how to get a hold of God. We don't know how to let God minister to us and comfort us, as it says in 1 Corinthians. He says, I've been comforted in all things that I can comfort others in all things also. And so until I have those troubles, then I cannot comfort people like I should. So tonight we're looking at this passage, these first four verses on what to do when you're feeling overwhelmed. Yeah, we normally are not overwhelmed by just one thing. It's when the second thing and the third thing and the fourth thing comes and we're just overwhelmed. David had these issues, so here we go. Very simple lesson tonight, and I want you to write it down. Trust it will help you because you may not be in it now, but the day comes when you feel overwhelmed. Here's the key. Number one, here we go. What do we do when I'm overwhelmed? Number one, Pray. You say, oh, preacher, that seems simple. It is simple, but we just don't do it. It is simple, but we don't apply ourselves. It is simple, but we don't utilize that opportunity. We need to pray. Look at verse number one. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. He says, boy, he said, I'm crying into you. When we get overwhelmed, we really only have two options. One is panic, and the other is prayer. We can start panicking. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. How many times you've ever panicked? But I know I have. And boy, when we panic, we say things, we do things, we react that we regret sometimes for the rest of our lives. 
So here he's in these trials. He said, my heart is overwhelmed. And what he's doing, he's beginning to pray. Very quickly, I want you to notice as he prayed, we see the passions of overcoming prayer. The passions. He's overcoming this overwhelmed spirit. He's overcoming this. He's coming out of this. He's going through it. And how he does it, first of all, we see the passions of overcoming prayer. By the way, the prayer that's going to make us through, the prayer that's going to actually deliver us through this overwhelmed spirit, it's got to be authentic. It's got to be real. I don't know about you, but I in my life have been known sometimes not to have my prayers always be as authentic, as real, as true, as powerful as they ought to be. We get in the routine, we just make it a ritual, and we pray like we're talking to an answering machine, and we just go on, but never really getting a hold of God. It must be authentic, and it must be real. I believe it's there in your notes in Psalm 17, 1. Hear, hear the right, O Lord, attend to my cry, there's that prayer, give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. He said, God, hear my prayer, because it's coming from real lips. Real talk, real prayer, real words, a real heart. He said, it's not fake. It's not just fancy words. It's not just something I do because that's how I was raised. It's not something I do because that's what everybody expects. He said, it is real. Our prayer must be authentic. It must be real. It must be something that's been part of our life. Hebrews eleven six. 6, I believe it's in your notes. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, that's what prayer is, coming to God, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if we're going to please God, we got to, and we come to him, we must come believing that he is. You know, a lot of people don't have that kind of prayer because they don't believe God is. They don't believe who God is. They don't believe what God says about himself. But I'm glad it says we have to believe that he is. He is holy. He is just. He is good. He is all powerful. He does have our best intentions. And I believe that he is. And so our prayer, if it's going to accomplish this, getting us through this overwhelmed state of our heart, it must be authentic. It's going to take a passion. I think, I'm, I can't remember if it's in your notes or not, but let me read it for you. Prayer to a God that we do not know, nor believe, all his word, nor obey all his commands, nor heed and learn from all his teachings, may well fall on deaf ears. When we're lying to God, when we're not obeying God, when we're not trusting God, it won't profit. Let's look at our text very quickly. Here we find two different cries. You know, in the Hebrew, it's two different words for the words cry there. Hear my cry. Right there it says verse number one. Hear my cry, O God. The word there, translated properly in English for cry, means a creaking or shrill sound or a shout of grief. In other words, this is that, that sobbing kind of cry. That's a sobbing kind of prayer. It's calling out to God with your heart is really, really broken. Uh, maybe it's been a long time since you've done that, but have you ever had that kind of Sorrow that you, as you cried, you shook. Maybe as you see your children sometimes when they're really broken up, it's just a shaking kind of cry. It's a very deep kind of cry. It's a very deep kind of sorrow. And that's what it is there. It's kind of a creaking sound, a groaning sound. He says, hear my cry. He's asking God, listen to me. Hear my, my moaning, if you will. Hear my broken heart. Hear my overcoming. And so we've got that. By the way, when we see a child like that, when we see an adult with that kind of passion, it brings compassion to us, doesn't it? You find somebody, there's a death in a family, or you find somebody maybe in an accident place somewhere, and they're just sobbing, and they're just broken, and they're just making sounds, our hearts go out to them. When our children are like that, our hearts go out. It brings compassion to us. We're moved. The psalmist here reminds us that that kind of cry, I believe, moves our Father also. He said, hear my cry, hear my brokenness, hear my, my creaking. But then there's the second one where it says, I cry unto thee, verse 2, and from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. That word cry is in a, like an accosting a person that you meet. It's to call out, hey, you across the street. Hey, you over there. It's that kind of cry. He cried out. First one was just groaning and just miserable. He said, God, hear my groanings, hear my shrieking. But now he said, I'm also, he said, I'm calling to you. By the way, I'm glad we can call out to God. 
I'm glad we can call upon Him. He wants us to, desires us to, and He will listen. So there's a passion in the prayer. So when we're going to make it through these overwhelming times, it's going to take a passion in prayer. Something's real, something fervent, something that's, that's alive in us. If we just say a prayer because we think we ought to, or we just say a prayer Mama taught us, but we're not going to have that help that we need to make it through when we're overwhelmed. So we find the passions of prayer. Secondly, we find the pouring of prayer. The pouring of prayer. In Psalm 62, just the next Psalm over, and in verse number 8, it says, Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. So that's what we find here. He's crying out to God. He's crying out with that brokenness, and it's pouring out His heart. See, pour out your heart. Pour out means just that. You open it wide. You empty it. You give it all. So when we go in prayer, it's not just, God, this is what I need, this is what I want. But when we're opening up like that, we just pour it out before Him. In Lamentations 2.19, Arise, cry out of the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands toward Him for the life of thy young children that faint in hunger the top of every street. They said, boy, pour out your heart like water. Again, until we get to the place where we've experienced that kind of overwhelming in our heart, we don't understand what it means to really pour out our heart, to open up our heart, to have those tears that flow, to have that kind of passionate prayer. But that's what David said. As he was running from his son, he was broken up. His heart was overwhelmed. A man with, a, the Bible says, with a oh, man after God's own heart was crying out for that, pouring out his heart. In 1 Samuel 1, 15, we know the story about Hannah and how she was praying and the priest was there and he thought she was drunk. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. See, if we're not used to having real fellowship in prayer with God, if we're not used to really pouring out our lives to Him and opening ourselves to Him, when the times of overwhelm comes in our heart, we won't know how to talk. We won't know how to pray to Him. We won't be ready for it. That's why it's important we have that routine of prayer. But pouring out of prayer. The pouring out of prayer. I re it's in your notes, the quote from Spurgeon. Are you still with me tonight? Yeah. Boy, this will help you. Look what it says, because we're talking about trials and difficulties and pouring out our heart to God. Charles Spurgeon, great preacher of older days, said, It is a good way to pray when the heart is turned upside down to spill all its contents at the foot of the throne of grace. That's what pouring out your heart, just turning it over. If you're going to pour out something, you just turn it over. You take that picture, you take that glass, you turn it over, pour it out. So it's a good way to pray when the heart is turned upside down to spill all its contents at the foot of the throne of grace. Perhaps sometimes the overwhelming of our heart is only meant to empty all the dredges out of it. That the last particle of self-righteousness and self-reliance and self-confidence may be drained out at the mercy seat that there may be room for an overflowing abundance of divine grace. But when we can pour out our hearts, that's not just that burden, but just everything. God, I'm just, I'm just empty. I'm just pouring it out before you. All that self-righteousness, all that self-confidence just has to go. So how do, what do we do when we're overwhelmed? We pray. We find the passions of prayer. We find the pouring of prayer. Thirdly, we find the places of prayer. We're going to go quicker now. The places of prayer. Notice what it says there in verse number 2. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. He says, man, I'm a long way from home. I'm a long way off. He said, I'm far away, but from the end of the wor world I will cry unto you. I'm glad we can pray everywhere. I'm glad we can pray in church. Amen. I'm glad about that. I'm glad we can pray in our little private closets, but I'm glad we can pray on well, you better be praying on Highway 680, that's for sure. Uh, we can pray there. We can pray in the workplace. We can pray everywhere. But he was talking about, he said, I'm just from the ends of the earth where I am. See, he was far away from the tabernacle. He was far away from his city. He was far away from his loved ones. He was far away from where he wanted to be and where he desired to be. He said, but from this end, I'm still crying. Oh, I'm glad that we can cry and pray unto him from everywhere. Because, by the way, we'll always be heard. You can always be heard. We won't always be heard, but we can always be heard. Psalm 94, 9. And he that planteth the ear, 
which is God, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see it? God can hear us in any place. But, and we've, not, we've done a study on this before, there are some hindrances to prayer where God doesn't hear. Sin keeps, our sin in our life keeps him from hearing us. If I regard iniquity in my heart, in other words, I keep sin in my heart. I keep that sin. I know it's there, and I'm just kind of living with it. I'm just kind of playing with it. I'm just regard it. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So the idea is let's keep our hearts right, but for wherever you are, you can pray. You can pray whether you're down at the mortuary, you can pray on the highway, you can work. I'm glad we can pray. It's the places of prayer. So you say, preacher, my heart is overwhelmed. It may come from a death this week. It may come from a health issue come this week in your life. But boy, when you get overwhelmed, you pray. You pray. Number two, follow. Follow. Look what it says. From the end of the, verse number two, from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me. Lead me. In other words, God says, here's the psalm, David's crying, he says, lead me. Yeah, if somebody's going to lead, there's not much going on unless you follow. You follow what I'm saying? We must follow. God's anxious to lead us. God is anxious to take us to the next step in every aspect of our life. He, does, he, he wants to do it. He said, I will lead you. But the problem is, we don't follow. God has the ability to lead. God has the desire to lead. We must follow. So here he is crying out. He says, lead me. So when you and I get our hearts overwhelmed, how we must do it is we need to say, God, you show me the way and I'll follow. You show me what needs to be done and I will follow. Don't just tell me and wait and say, you lead me, you show me and I will do it. The problem is when we get overwhelmed, we want to do it our way. We say, God, show me and then I'll decide. You tell me what you think I ought to do. And then I'll decide. No, we just need to follow. So we've got the prayer there. He says, his heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock. It's not his problem. He's willing to lead. It's ours when we don't follow. Here's the thing. We need to follow because we don't know what to do. That's what he's crying. We get, God often takes us to the place where we say, I've tried everything. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to go any forward. My heart's overwhelmed. I'm just at a loss. It's not in us. Very quickly, we are led by the Word. We are led by the Word, the Bible itself. Psalm 119, 105, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So when we're in that darkness, remember overwhelmed means in darkness. It means travailing. It's a dark covering. When we say, I don't know where to go. I can't see what to do. God's Word is that light to our feet and to our path. Psalm, uh, Proverbs 6, 23, for the commandment, God's commands, is a lamp and the law is a light. So as long as we obey, we got light to follow. Amen. It's there for us. And so this is, we're led by the word. The Bible tells us what we need to do. Every principle, every instruction. You say, preacher, my, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. Do what the Bible says. If it's a financial issue, do what the Bible says. If it's a marital issue, do what the Bible says. If it's a sin issue, do what the Bible says. If it's an employer an issue, do what the Bible says. We're led by the word. Not only are we led by the word, but we're led by the Holy Spirit. Led by the Holy Spirit. Psalm 8, 14. For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Holy Spirit leads us. When you're saved, when you get born again, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, and He's that comforter, and He leads us. So we're led by the Word. We're led by the Holy Spirit. And I love this part. We are led to the rock. We are led to the rock. Look what it says. Lead me to the rock that is higher than than I. Talk to me, class. Who's the rock? Jesus Christ. He's that rock. That's what he told Simon Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church. Not Peter, but the rock, what Peter just said, that he is the Christ, the Son of, uh, the, son of the living God. He said, upon this rock. And so the Bible tells us over, he's the stone. He's the rock that was set aside by the builder. He is the rock. So now he says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. If you want a picture like the picture for our, our slides tonight of the overwhelming being a rage of water, a rage of current, where we feel overwhelmed, where we feel like we're about to drown, where it's dark and we feel oppressed and it's just on top of us, we need to come out and be lifted up to that rock that's higher than us. How many are glad God is higher than us? 
<laughs> oh, not just a little bit, but much higher than us. So our hearts are then raised above the raging torrents of troubled waters. In Psalm 119, 164, I believe it's in notes, seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgment. Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The rock higher than I restores peace. The rock higher than I am restores peace. So as you feel overwhelmed and say, man, I just don't have any peace. The rock provides peace. Again, with that word, they love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. <laughs> but as we're following God and obeying God and seeking Him, He's that rock that is higher than us. It restores peace. So if you want to picture it in your life as you're overwhelmed, you go to the rock. It's way up there. The storm is here, the flood is here, the miry clay is here, the difficulties are here. Lead me to the rock that is higher than me. The problem is, most of this world wants to bring Jesus down to their level. No, Lord, take me up to your level. Restore to the rock that is higher than I, very quickly. The rock that is higher than I restores peace. It, it removes pride. That rock removes pride. When I get to the place where I realize that rock is higher than me, it says in Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm glad God doesn't think like me. Are you out there? I'm glad He does not think like me. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your ways. God's ways, God's thoughts are much higher than I. You see, when we get overwhelmed, when we get to that rock and we say, God, lift me to that rock, lift me out of this mess, and I'm going to go to the rock that's higher than me, we realize I don't have the answer, but He does. I don't have a solution. Because when you're overwhelmed, you realize you don't have any control. When you're in the hospital and the doctor says, there's no hope. You can have all the positive thoughts you want, you can have all the ways you think, but you have no control, it's all God. When you've lost a job and you're looking for the next one, you realize you might have the best resume in town, but God's got to run to bring it upon. I don't have any control over life or death. Who am I? He's higher than me, that rock higher than me. So it removes pride when we say, God, I can't do it. Take me to the rock higher than me. Those thoughts, those ways. To the rock higher than me causes me to rely upon His pity. Cause me to rely upon His pity. Now, before you think about pity, we often think about pity as being something negative and something sour. Well, I'm just having no. Pity is compassion. Pity is care. The Bible talks about when you see your child, you have pity on them. In other words, compassion on them. Your heart is breaking for them. Your heart is going out to them. It's not oh how sad. No, it's that movement. And so I'm glad God has pity, if you will, compassion for us. And so when I go to the rock that's higher than me, it makes me rely on His pity, rely on His compassion compassion, rely on His love to have mercy and forgiveness. Aren't you glad His rock of pity, if you will, is much higher than me? No matter how, no matter how tall the pile of sin I have in my life, His forgiveness is higher. Amen? No matter how much trouble I have in my life, His forgiveness, His pity, His compassion is more than that. Romans 5.20, Moreover, the law entreated, I think it's there in your notes, that the offense may abound, but where sin abounded, no matter how bad sin is, no matter how bad we are, grace, God's grace, did much more abound. See, our salvation, we realize that God's love for us, Jesus Christ's blood shed on the cross of Calvary for your sins and mine is more than enough for anybody's sin. Amen? Aren't you glad we, God doesn't say, well, I'll save you. I shed my blood for you. But let's just see how bad your sin, uh, getting pretty close. Sorry, you're over the limit. Not that way. God's grace much more abounds over our sin. I'm glad for that. Oh, when I was age 19 and realized a sinner headed for hell couldn't do anything about it, but Jesus already had, there was no question would that He had the power to forgive me. There's no question whether or not He had power to save me because He's the rock that's much higher than me. We sing the song about it, but here's the verse Psalm 40, verse 2, He brought me up, I'm talking about God, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Boy, before you're saved, that's where you are, you're in the pit. 
Even after you're saved, when you get down and discouraged, you're in that pit. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a, what class? Rock, amen, and establish my goings. He put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Boy, that's what salvation is. We come out of the miry clay of sin and of disgust and wickedness, and he lifts us up by his love because of the cross of Calvary and sets us on the rock and establishes our going, a rock that's much higher than I. See, I'm down in the pit. I'm glad he just didn't put a little rock down in the pit and says, stand on that. Amen? Much higher. Pulled me out of that and put me on that rock. Very quickly, we're almost done. What do I do when I feel overwhelmed? Pray. Really pray. Follow. Follow God's instructions. Number three, remember. Remember. Remember His past protections. Verse two, From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed, and lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been. He didn't say is. He has been. He said it's not just today, but he has been. He said I've been in the past. He said I've been through trouble like this before. I've been through heartaches like this before. For thou hast been in the past a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. He said I remember. He said I'm asking you to lift me out of here. Hear my cry. Lift me out of here and put me on a rock that's higher than me. He said I'm crying like that because I know you've done it before. I know you've kept me from the enemy before. You've provided for me before. You've been a shelter for me before. Ladies and gentlemen, every time we get to the place where we say, I can't do it and God must, and He does, the next time you have more faith and confidence in God for Him to do it. Oh, first time you lose your job. You think, oh, what are we going to do? We'll starve. We'll die. God provides. God provides, and He provides a new job. Praise the Lord. Three years later, you lose your job again. And you start the same thing. What are we going to do? We're going to die. You say, wait a minute. I've been through this before. i got to remember. When we begin to feel overwhelmed, we say, wait a minute. God's done something for me in the past. I'm all right. He can do that. He can do this. That's why many times our trials get bigger and bigger and bigger so that we can have more and more faith in Him, because God is still able to do that. And so He said, I remember, for Thou hast been a shelter for me, and a strong tower in the past from the enemy. So I Romans 5, 3, there in your notes, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. <laughs> he wants us to glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation, trials, difficulty, worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And the hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. So these trials and tribulations, it does a work in our heart as we begin to grow as a Christian. Very quickly at the last. Oop, two more, we'll go quick. Abide. What do I do when I feel overwhelmed? I abide. I abide. Verse 4, I will abide in their tabernacle forever. The word abide means to live, but it's an interesting word there in the Hebrew, not trying to Hebrew us to death. But that word there means literally to turn aside from the road. To turn, he said, I abide, I live, but I've turned aside from the Lord. In other words, here I'm going down the road and I'm getting overwhelmed. I just, I don't know what to do. Wait a minute, I know what I can do. I'm going to turn aside to the Lord. I think I'll just stop and go in. I think I'll stop and abide. Oh, that's what he said. Just abide. Abide. He said, I'm going to abide in your tabernacle. Oh, we don't have time to go into all that. But the tabernacle, of course, was is two aspects. Abiding in the tabernacle, if you want to put it in the modern term, that's the church. The tabernacle was the place where they worshiped God. It's the place where they had to sacrifice us. And he said, I'm going to abide. Notice what it says. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. David, as we know, loved the church. By the way, the Bible says Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In fact, in Psalm 27, God through David said, One thing have I desired of the Lord. He said, i got one thing I've asked of the Lord. That will I seek after. Well, what is that, David? Lots of money, lots of power, lots of... No. That I should dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Psalm 84, 4, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They shall still praising thee. I was glad when they said unto me, go into the house, let us go into the house of the Lord. 
So it's the tabernacle. But David loved it. But you know, here's a pr- problem. He's not near the tabernacle now. He's on the runway out there. He said, that's where I want to be. He said, I'm going to dwell there. He said, but we're talking about the tabernacle. I believe that tabernacle is also God's presence. His presence. We can always be in His presence. We can always be in Him as our tabernacle. Psalm 1611. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. And just abide with God. Just pull aside. Stop going the wrong direction and turn off the road and live with Him. Stay close with Him. Walk with Him. Then lastly, what do I do when I'm overwhelmed? Pray, follow, remember, abide, and then trust. Trust in His wings. Verse 4, I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert or the coverings of thy wings. Many places in the Bible it talks about God's wings and providing cover and protection, getting underneath the wings of God. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He's about to get ready to go to the cross and He's looking at the city. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings? And ye would not. Well, God wants to put His wings over us. Let us be the little chicks and underneath, just like a chicken with the wings, wings spread out over her hens. Just protection, warming, security. That's what David said. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Psalm 91, 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust. His trust shall be thy shield and the buckler. One last thought. The word trust there in the Hebrew, if this is key, is more than just a feeling. The word trust there, the one that's translated trust there, means to flee for protection. So it's not just a feeling. I'm trusted. I'm going there. I'm headed there. I'm getting under the wings. I am moving there. I'm trusting, not just in my head, not just with a feeling in my heart, but I am fleeing for protection to have hope and refuge. David on the run from his son. Maybe his son's going to kill him. He's already taken his counselors, done so much. He said, my heart's overwhelmed. He says, but I know what to do. I know what to do. It's that faith. I'm going to pray. I'm going to cry out to God. I'm going to follow what God tells me. I'm going to remember how he's already helped me in the past, that he can deal with this one also. And I think I'll just abide. I'm just going to stay close to him, stay in his presence, and I'm going to trust him. I'm just going to enjoy that time under his wings. Now, we can say, well, that's a very interesting psalm. And then trouble's going to come next week, and you'll feel overwhelmed. And you'll go to maybe turn to drugs or alcohol or some other thing and say, wait a minute, no, no. That's not what we're supposed to do when we feel overwhelmed. God just showed us what we're to do when we feel overwhelmed. Let's bow our heads, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just for a moment. As God showed you something that you need to prepare for, If you put a burden in your heart that you need to get some things aligned up, maybe a prayer life, maybe more time in the Word, studying the Word, maybe just dwelling in His presence more, maybe more faithful in church, I don't know, preparing for those days when you're overwhelmed. But let's decide we're going to do it. We're not going to lose out. We're not going to fail when it comes because His strength is there. But it all starts by being pulled out of that miry clay and put on the rock, being saved, being born again, Because we know the Bible says we're all sinners and deserve hell. But God loved us so much, He died for us to pay the sin debt. And if we'll come believing, trusting, and calling, He promises to save us and take us to heaven as David was saved. So, Lord, I ask You to help us tonight. I don't know the need like You do. We oftentimes have those times of being overwhelmed. Help us learn. And again, God, if there is somebody here that's not saved, they'll get saved tonight. Put all this in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. We stand to our feet and while the piano plays, it's called the invitation. We invite you to come. If you need to do business with God and pray, we can do that. If you're not sure you're on the way to heaven, whether you do.